Hello, this is the first video of a series of three produced by the student Carolina Plots, Robson Dominguez, and William De Vega. We are second semester students in the Radiology Technology Program at the Federal Technological University of Piranha. These videos were produced for the anatomy course, taught by Professor Katia, in which we will discuss Guillabar syndrome. In this first video, we will cover about the anatomy and definition of Guillabar syndrome. The nervous system is composed of the brain, spine, nerves, ganglia, and special sensory organs such as the eyes and ears. Its function is to regulate the body's activities through electrical impulses transmitted by neurons that travel through various nerves. The nervous system is divided into two. The central nervous system, consisting of the axial skeleton, skull, and spine, and the peripheral nervous system, consisting of nerves and ganglia, which controls our body. Nerves are nerve fibers grouped in bundles located outside the brain or spinal cord. The nerve fibers are axons, extensions of neurons, and their sheaths. Nerves are responsible for communicating between nervous centers and effector organs such as glands and muscles, as well as for sensitivity. Since the role of nerves is to convey information, when they are damaged, this information ceases to be transmitted to the nervous centers and other parts of the body. Therefore, injuries to these structures can be responsible, for example, for loss of sensitivity, tingling sensations, muscle atrophy, loss of strength, weakness in the affected area. Nerve injuries can have different causes, with many of them triggered by traumas. However, some diseases can cause injuries to these structures, such as diabetes and autoimmune diseases. Guillabar syndrome was initially described in 1859 by Landry, who described a case of ascending weakness that progressed to paralysis over three weeks and ended in death due to respiratory failure. The case became known as Landry's ascending paralysis. Years later, in 1919, three military doctors, George Guia, Jean Alexander Barr, and Andre Stroll, reported similar cases to Landry's ascending paralysis, but with albuminocytological dissociation seen in cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, becoming known as Guillabar syndrome stroll or more commonly Guillabar syndrome. Guillabar syndrome is an acute or subacute autoimmune polyneuropathy and its variants or subgroups being a demyelinating disease that affects the peripheral nervous system. Guillabar syndrome is the most frequent cause of paralytic neuropathy, characterized by acute onset with rapid progression, presenting with symmetric muscle weakness in the legs, which may progress to the upper limbs and face, potentially affecting all four limbs and causing cranial nerve disease, leading to profound loss of tendon reflexes. Guillabar syndrome is a disease that evolves in phases. The first phase occurring within the first 24 hours after symptom onset, characterized by disease progression. Days later, the plateau phase begins, characterized by disease stability. Months later, the initial recovery phase begins. The last phase is rehabilitation, which occurs over months or years, with some patients achieving full recovery while others remain with residual weakness. The International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, ICD-10, code for Guillabar syndrome is G61.0 Guillabar syndrome. Part 2 will cover epidemiology, symptoms, and diagnosis. Thank you.
This is part two of the video on Guillabar syndrome conducted by students Carolina, Robson, and William for the anatomy course. In part one, we learned about anatomy and definition. Now, we will explore epidemiology, symptoms, and diagnosis. Guillabar syndrome, also known as acute polyradiculoneuritis, is the leading cause of generalized flaccid paralysis worldwide. With an annual incidence of 0.81 to 1.89 cases per 100,000 inhabitants, it mainly affects the population between 20 and 40 years of age of both sexes. Under normal circumstances, cases occur sporadically and do not seem to show seasonality. In Brazil, there is a scarcity of systematized data on Guillabar syndrome. During the Zika virus epidemic from March to August 2015, the overall incidence of Guillabar syndrome and other neurological manifestations was 4.4 cases per 100,000 inhabitants in Bahia, with 4.2 cases per 100,000 inhabitants in Salvador. The incidence of Guillabar syndrome and other neurological manifestations was 5.0 per 100,000 inhabitants among men and 3.8 per 100,000 inhabitants among women, with a median overall age of 44 years, range 2 to 83 years. On June 26, 2023, the National Center for Epidemiology, Prevention, and Disease Control of Peru issued an epidemiological alert due to the increase in Guillabar syndrome cases in different regions of the country. A total of 191 cases of Guillabar syndrome meeting the case definition established for the country were reported, of which 77 were confirmed cases, including four deaths. 59% of the reported cases were men, 112 cases, aged between 2 and 86 years, with an average age of 41 years. In 41% of cases, adults, 77 cases, aged between 30 and 59 years were affected, followed by the group of older adults, over 60 years, with 26.7% of cases, 51 cases. There were 38 cases in children under 17 years of age. Approximately 60% to 70% of patients with Guillabar syndrome have some antecedent acute illness, one to three weeks before, with Campylobacter jejuni infection being the most frequent, 32%, followed by cytomegalovirus, 13%, Epstein-Barr virus, 10%, and other viral infections, such as hepatitis A, B, and C, influenza and human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Most patients initially perceive the disease through the sensation of paresthesias in the distal extremities of the lower limbs, followed by the upper limbs. Neuropathic lumbar pain or leg pain may be seen in at least 50% of cases. Progressive weakness is the most noticeable sign to the patient, occurring in the following order. Lower limbs, arms, trunk, head, and neck. The intensity can vary from mild weakness, which does not even motivate seeking primary care, to complete tetraplegia requiring mechanical ventilation due to paralysis of accessory respiratory muscles. Facial weakness occurs in half of the patients during the course of the disease. Between 5% and 15% of patients develop ophthalmoplegia and ptosis. Sphincter function is mostly preserved, while loss of myotatic reflexes may precede sensory symptoms even in minimally affected muscles. Autonomic instability is a common finding, occasionally causing significant arrhythmias, but rarely persisting beyond two weeks. The main symptoms include pain, tingling, weakness, and loss of sensation in the legs and arms, hindering movement. Weakness in the diaphragm, facial muscles, and mouth, impairing breathing, speech, and eating. Difficulty controlling urine and feces. Fear, anxiety, fainting, and dizziness. Palpitations in the chest and rapid heart rate. Changes in blood pressure with high and low pressure readings. Patients with Guillabar syndrome typically present muscle weakness in more than one appendicular segment symmetrically, including cranial muscles. Distal myotatic reflexes are usually reduced or absent. 
The progression of signs and symptoms is of utmost importance, not exceeding eight weeks and with recovery beginning two to four weeks after the plateau phase. Demonstration of relative symmetry of limb paresis. Mild to moderate sensory signs. Involvement of cranial nerves, especially expressed by bilateral weakness of facial muscles. Pain. Autonomic dysfunction. Absence of fever at the onset of the condition. In part three, we will see examinations and treatment. Thank you. This is part three of the video on Guillain-Barre syndrome conducted by students Carolina, Robson, and William for the anatomy course. There are several possible tests to diagnose a patient with Guillain-Barre syndrome. One of the tests that can be performed is the analysis of cerebrospinal fluid, which is collected through a lumbar puncture. In this test, the following will be analyzed. The concentration of protein and the presence of cells slash MM superscript 3. Another method of examination is electroneuromyography analysis, which is a complementary examination consisting of a set of diagnostic tests to assess the function of the peripheral nervous system, nerves, muscles, and neuromuscular junction. The examination is basically divided into two parts, the study of nerve conduction, which involves the application of low-intensity and short-duration electrical pulses, and electromyography, which is performed using small needles inserted into the muscles to analyze their electrical activity, thus detecting and quantifying the severity of diseases of motor roots, spinal cord, and muscle fibers. Electroneuromyography allows for the classification of the main forms of Guillain-Barre syndrome presentation, differentiating between demyelinating forms and axonal forms of the peripheral nerve. In the electroneuromyography examination, the following will be analyzed. Reduction of motor conduction velocity in two or more nerves. Blockage of compound motor action potential conduction or abnormal temporal dispersion in one or more nerves. Prolongation of distal motor latency in two or more nerves. Prolongation of F-wave latency or absence of this wave. Several diagnostic criteria have been proposed for the clear definition of Guillain-Barre syndrome diagnosis, requiring all specified below. Presence of two essential criteria. Presence of at least three suggestive clinical criteria. Absence of more than one situation reducing the possibility of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Absence of situations excluding the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Analysis of cerebrospinal fluid. Electroneuromyography compatible with the disease and thorough additional investigation to rule out other etiologies. With a positive result for Guillain-Barr syndrome, patients need to be initially admitted to the hospital for rigorous observation. Care for them is best found in tertiary centers, with intensive care facilities and a team of professionals familiar with the special needs of patients with this syndrome. Strict surveillance and anticipation of potential complications are necessary to optimize the chances of a favorable outcome. Treatment for Guillain-Barr syndrome can be non-pharmacological through plasmapheresis, which involves separating plasma and blood cells, with the latter being rain-fused after dilution in albumin diluted with gelatin or fresh plasma. Its use in treatment is based on the removal of antibodies, complement, and other factors responsible for nerve damage. Each session of plasmapheresis removes one-to-one and a half plasma volumes, with a 48-hour interval between sessions. Another possible treatment is pharmacological with intravenous human immunoglobulin, which has become the treatment of choice in most countries due to its ease of use, despite its mechanism of action being poorly understood. Its efficacy in motor recovery, risk of death, and adverse effects compared to plasmapheresis treatment showed similar results within two weeks. The recommended dose of immunoglobulin is 2g slash kg divided over 2 to 5 days. A higher daily dose may increase the risk of renal or vascular complications, especially in elderly patients. 
0.4 g slash kg slash day is administered intravenously. Treatment is discontinued if there is any evidence of renal function loss or anaphylaxis. Before administering immunoglobulin, renal function evaluation, serum immunoglobulin A level, HIV serology, and hydration should be assessed. During administration, clinical signs of anaphylaxis and adverse effects should be monitored, such as chest, hip, or back pain, nausea and vomiting, chills, fever, malaise, fatigue, weakness or mild dizziness, headache, urticaria, erythema, chest tightness, and dyspnea. After treatment, if patients do not improve or even worsen, a new treatment is not clearly defined. There is the option to repeat the initial treatment or use immunoglobulin after plasmapheresis, based on expert opinion. The use of plasmapheresis after immunoglobulin is not recommended. If the patient shows progressive worsening beyond eight weeks after the onset, consider the diagnosis of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy, whose treatment is different. Patients should be periodically reassessed after discharge, at the discretion of the physician, until their improvement stabilizes. Here are some references used for the completion of the work. Thank you very much.